crass self-interest uh, as opposed to, to altruism. There's already a, a mixture in the non-human animal. Can you suggest that although the altruism still has to be explained, yeah. of course they think it does, but what now really has to be explained is the rather complex set of differences that we find across the spectrum. And my worry here is when someone says something like, we don't yet find the personality of non-human animals, is I'm not sure what this could be. Because it seems to me the personality requires language, intention, yes. foresight, planning, lots of things that neither dolphins nor gorillas have. They get what they do have. Yeah. And you then look at how far they might go down this road, I'm not sure there is something lacking. My only problem is that of difficulty in observing. I think it's quite simply projecting onto the non human animal species uh, the wrong kind of limitation. Yeah, that's, that's right. For, for, the, for the Good Samaritan, you have to have social institutions of a kind that, that we, we, don't, we don't see amongst, amongst non-human animals. But uh, I, 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 again, I'm not, I don't, I'm not claiming expertise here, but uh, you'd find something analogous to the Good Samaritan if you found a preference strategy amongst non-human animals of loving enemies. Because there are enemies, whether you're human or not human. Uh, and as, I, as I've read the, the primatologists, they don't, they don't find that. So you, you, you will find self-sacrifice for, for, for somebody to whom you're related or somebody within your group. But the idea of, of, of self-sacrifice for an enemy doesn't yet seem to be empirically discovered. Well, no. Okay, self-sacrifice, so get something very close to it or what is not in your group, I think a very striking case much reported in local newspapers through relatively few years ago in the zoo in Chicago when a small infant fell into yeah. the gorilla. Yeah. But and that's not an enemy. No, no, no. It's an alien. Yeah. It's <laughs> not the only yeah. What yeah. actually happened was that the oldest female gorilla Wave all the other gorillas back yes. in a threatening way, went and picked up the child and traded it yes. and walked over to wait for it to be taken from yes. treating it maternally. Yes. Uh, I think that if you look at what would be the furthest it might go without language and classification from a future language and social institution, we're coming very close to this. Yeah. You, you, you do, I'll say one more thing. You, you, you find amongst, for example, vampire bats. The, the disposition to share blood with uh, other bats that, 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 that aren't g genetically related as far as we can tell. But, but, but an enemy is a conspecific. Right? An enemy is a conspecific who is part of a group that is attacking you. And to, to, to find the equivalent of a good Samaritan <laughs> in a non-human animal, that's what you'd have to find. You'd have to find self-sacrifice for an enemy. Uh, Um, thank you. Uh, so we, uh, we read that there's no trespass uh, before there's law. Um, and some interpretation of this, what the law gives is, is, is really knowledge of the law. So before, uh, before we know, there's no um, trespass. And um, you know, this might give us a, that, that ought implies knowledge of the ought. Or at least it implies that one ought to have knowledge of the, of the ought. And I'm thinking, in terms of, of divine uh, command theory, that we are put in a, in a difficult epistemic situation where we're uh, attempting to, to, where we need to know two things. First, is it, is it God behind this command? And the second thing is, what is the command? Yeah. Both of those things require um, an interpretive framework um, and fr from which I might be working deductively, eudonistically, um, and it seems like that 
it seems like that's a, a, a fundamental difficulty. What I'm wondering is, is the, is the primary assistance which God gives um, in order for this to work, is that primary assistance that with the command he's also supplying the conditions and the criteria that are necessary to apprehend the command and, and the, apprehend that the command is from God? Yes, now I just remembered something. I was supposed to repeat the, <laughs> the question each time for, 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 the, for the sake of the, um, the posterity. Um, <laughs> but but um, so, so let, let, me just, let me just try. The trouble is that this was a long and complicated question. But I, 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 I think the idea is um, uh, uh, that um, in order to have an obligation, um, you have to know what the obligation is. Uh, and uh, therefore it has to have been shown to you in some way. And what are we to say about um, uh, Paul in, 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 in the beginning of Romans? Um, uh, and what kind, of, what kind of knowledge of the law happens before special revelation in, for example, the Decalogue? Uh, I, I didn't say anything actually in this talk about moral epistemology. Uh, I think this is extremely difficult. Uh, the way Kant talks about it um, is that there are two kinds of revelation. They're both kinds of revelation. They're, they're, he thinks of it in, as two concentric circles. Uh, there's the revelation to reason, which is in the inside circle, and then there's the revelation to particular people at particular times and particular places in the outside circle. And then he, 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 he undertakes a translation exercise to see how much he can understand of what's in the outer circle in terms of what's in the inside circle. But my point is, he calls what's in the inside circle, which is available to all people at all times and all places, revelation. Um, so, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, God, uh, in giving commands to us, has to reveal those commands to us. But I haven't said how God does that. Uh, and that, that's something you know, that would, would, would require a lot of, um, a lot of, of discussion. Uh, I think I'm not going to go further into that now. Yeah, sorry. You get some very persuasive arguments uh, to show that the commandments in the second table of the Decalogue, there are possible conditions under which they would have no application, for at least some of them, perhaps, perhaps all of them. But uh, was this, did I understand this correctly? This was an aid of the following uh, conclusion, that one cannot deduce that the act that's commanded or forbidden as the case may be, that one ought to perform it or ought not to perform it, as the case may be, from human nature. Yes. Would it still be possible that if the act is one, that uh, from human nature and the premise that the act is one, that it's possible for human beings to perform in the circumstances in which they occupy, that they ought not to perform it, or, as the case may be, ought to perform it? Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so, so the, the question is um, whether we would get a uh, deduction of the second table if we added to uh, human nature premises about the possibility of the acts that are either required or forbidden for human beings. Mm, I don't think so. Um, that is, uh, let's take uh, theft, for example. I think private property was possible for uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, I think private property was possible after Pentecost. Uh, but I don't think if we add the possibility of private property to human nature, we get a deduction of uh, the proscription on theft. Church and interacts only with members of the primitive church, and there is no private property in that group. That is possible for him. Yes, that's true. 
that, that's what I meant. Yes. That in circumstances where yes. the, the individuals to whom the command is addressed are mm -hmm. capable of uh, performing. So if we, if we add the existence of the institution, because in, in all of these cases, what makes the possibility of, of, the, of the violation... Uh, if it's lying and direct communicate or reproductive, uh, whatever so, general yeah. conditions make this possible for the individual. Yeah. <clears throat> so would we get a deduction if we added the existence of the institution to human nature? Um, th there's going to be a circularity worry here that, that um, the institution is normative. Uh, so the institution... Uh, uh, is already going to, to contain its prescriptions for, for, for um, practice. Uh, and so if we add to human nature an endorsement of the institution, then we will indeed get a deduction. But that's because the institution already contains within it normative principles. Uh, if we don't add the endorsement of the institution, then I don't think we get the deduction. Because it might be a sinful institution. Well, what I want to say one is, one should, can you deduce from human nature that an individual human being ought not to do X if it's possible for that human being to do X. Now, you may have to, in the background, assume the existence in the case of theft. Yes, you might have to uh, assume a normative institution, but I, I won't. Yeah, that, that, certainly that, that requires more, more thought. Anybody else?